thank you so, so much uh, for inviting me and thank you all of you for tuning in. I know there are many other possible things that you could be doing and uh, I hopefully will provide uh, something of a, an introduction, hopefully an entertaining introduction to the topic of Bronze Age hordes. Now, key question, what is a Bronze Age horde? Bronze Age hordes are a pan-European phenomenon. This is something that doesn't happen nearly as much in the Near East uh, or in Central Asia, South Asia or Eastern Asia. In the Bronze Age from 2200 BC through to 800 BC, you've got large-scale depositions of metalwork outside of settlement or grave contexts, usually copper, bronze or gold, but can be lead or silver. They're deliberately place they're not recycled or retrieved and they usually seen as uh, at least two metal objects together uh, but there's an increasing focus on single finds my dog has just broken into the office just in case you're wondering what that was um, now what this means is that when you have discoveries as you hear with the fantastic near eggleston hordes and in 2019 by metal detectorists and jointly excavated by archaeologists, including Parr and Ben Westwood, uh, you have a classic hoard, a collection of bronze objects found together. If, you, if here you have weapons and ornaments. However, you also have these spectacular single finds, which uh, I don't think should be ignored simply because they don't fit in this traditional definition. So, for instance, uh, from Bromiholm, uh, near Chester Street, you have this shield find. Now, a lot of these bronzes, as Paul alluded to, were found in uh, earlier periods prior to much professional archaeology going on. And they were typically retrieved and then have frequently had some quite strange biographies. So this one in particular found in 1802 during peak cutting. It was then cut into pieces by the finder to share with his friends. And two pieces ended up uh, in the Society of Antiquaries in Newcastle and now in the Great North Museum. You can see clearly there which parts are replica and which parts are not. There's only about 90 of these shields known in the entirety of Europe. So this is a very rare find, and this is a spectacularly fine example of Bronze Age craftsmanship. Also within this strange hoard category is the uh, hoard such as the Heathery Burn Hoard. This is a, a very large collection of objects uh, that uh, were found during quarrying of a cave site near Stanhope. And here they date primarily to the Late Bronze Age, so 1,100 to 800 BC. Large collections of bronze weapons, bronze tools, bronze ornaments, as well as gold ornaments as well. Found frequently associated with human bones, but not excavated by archaeologists. Sadly, the spectacular cave is no more. Uh, it has been completely destroyed by quarrying um, and we can't reinvestigate the site. But it remains uh, the largest collection uh, of Bronze Age metalwork that we know about in Northern England. Now, how are Bronze Age hordes discovered? As I mentioned, traditionally you've had a lot of finds coming in the 18th and 19th century made by farmers and labourers. Uh, peak cutting is a classic one. We'll get back to this point about Bronze Age hordes frequently being found in peat deposits, former wetland deposits, etc. And they were then purchased by gentlemen antiquarians and collectors. It was very fashionable, as many of you know, to be an uh, antiquarian or archaeologist in the 19th century. And Canon Greenwell, who was the biggest and most prolific one in this part of the world, and even has his own blue plaque in the centre of Durham, uh, he was a very prolific uh, acquirer of all sorts of Bronze Age bronze and gold objects. Archaeologists came fairly late onto the scene in terms of discovering Bronze Age hordes, and even with the tens of thousands of excavations that have been undertaken by developer-funded archaeology, hardly any professional archaeologists have ever discovered a Bronze Age hoard. And yet, there's been a vast increase in the amount of Bronze Age hordes being found. You can see here, thanks to Ed Caswell, this graph indi indicates decade by decade, a huge increase uh, from the 1990s in the discovery of Bronze Age hordes. Now, this, as I said, is not due to professional archaeologists. This is largely due to metal detectorists, and here with the discoverer of, discoverer of the Eggleston horde. 
And metal detecting, as you know, in this country is legal. Uh, and with the rapid growth of metal detecting in the 80s and the 90s, a law was brought in called the Treasure Act in 1996. Now, this is important because it both compels the finder to actually report any gold or silver over 300 years. So that's definitely Bronze Age gold, any object. And from 2002, so just a few years after the 1996 Act, it compelled uh, any find of two or more prehistoric metal objects, base metal objects, so bronze, for instance, found together to also report them. And once their identity is verified, they are independently valued, and a museum can actually then purchase them, and half of that money would go to the finder and half would go to the landowner. So this Treasure Act revolutionized the reporting of Bronze Age hoards, and that's why we have this huge increase in the numbers. Now, for anything not covered under the Treasure Act, and indeed for things covered under the Treasure Act, there is the Portable Antiquity Scheme. If you aren't already familiar with it, do have a look. It's the most fantastic database of publicly made archaeological finds, www.finds.org.uk. And here, for instance, searching for Bronze Age Penanular Ring, a late Bronze Age form of ornament, you get a symbol that comes up uh, just in uh, Northumberland there. And here you have um, a very, very nice um, Bronze Age coiled ring that comes up there once you click on it. So these are the publicly available finds. The location data is somewhat restricted, uh, but you usually get down to the parish. But it gives you a really fascinating insight. And for me, this is one of the great revolutions in archaeology uh, in my lifetime, along with developer-funded archaeology. Now, how many Bronze Age hordes are we talking about in Britain? So Ed, who I should uh, mention once again here, is in his spare time uh, doing a database of all Bronze Age hordes. These are not single finds, these are hordes. Um, he's currently up to 1,856 of them. And this doesn't include single finds. And he's seeking to build up a comprehensive database in order to compare to databases on settlements, monuments, and other such phenomena to try and build up a map uh, of Bronze Age Britain, which would really give us a great insight. Now, what can we learn from Bronze Age hordes? I want to start by talking uh, about the driest possible subject. And as the father of two young boys who essentially went feral during lockdown uh, and now refuse to eat vegetables, this is essentially the extra broccoli course, and I've completely undercooked it. Now, the most important things about Bronze Age hordes can be expressed in all forms of scholarship. I want to pay tribute before I go on to the broccoli course to two of the great scholars uh, of the Northeast uh, and beyond of the Bronze Age. Firstly is Colin Burgess, a hugely inspirational figure who spent his professional life in Newcastle, uh, founded all sorts of projects, uh, the Northern Archaeology Group, etc. Uh, and trained a lot of Bronze Age archaeologists. And one of his students, Ian Colhoun, worked extensively on Bronze Age metalwork, specifically swords. Now, onto the dry subject. Bronze and Bronze Age hordes chronologically underpin the Bronze Age. They literally allow us to access time. They structure the Bronze Age, and they still do. Even though we have tens of thousands of radiocarbon dates, you are still dealing with time periods called the Early Bronze Age, the Middle Bronze Age, and the Late Bronze Age. And they were defined over a century ago, frequently on the basis of axe types, for instance. And you can see here a flat axe, a flanged axe, and a socketed axe. And if that wasn't enough, you can go to a whole nother level of detail with bronzes. And you get very, very, very different numbers of bronzes in different periods. It's important to realize with EBA there for early Bronze Age, MBA for middle Bronze Age, and LBA for late Bronze Age, you see that there's a massive increase in the late Bronze Age in the sheer number of bronzes that we are finding. But nonetheless, you start to get these very detailed insights when you look in detail. Now this, I'm going to show you two tables and then we're going to get back to doing all sorts of wonderful shiny things. But these two tables give you some sort of idea of the level of detail that you can get to with bronzes. So here you have uh, down the left hand side and the right, you have the chronological time periods and then you have 
200 year roughly metalwork phases where you have certain types of metal objects being found together. This was all put together without radiocarbon dates and sub subsequently been actually developed with radiocarbon dates. And so for the late Bronze Age that I've got to here, you'll notice in the centre at the bottom, Ewart Park is its own metalwork phase. Yes, the late Bronze Age in Britain is defined and named after a site in Northumberland, famous for the discovery of its swords. So I'm going to skip on from that because otherwise I'm going to see the numbers of my audience go through the floor. But I just want to give you that insight that really for Britain, Ireland and continental Europe, bronze and bronze hordes structure the entire time period of how we understand it. Now, uh, what else can we do? Uh, we can look in great detail at the particular objects, the design of the objects. I mentioned the Ewart Park swords, and here you have full replicas of them here. You can see the sequence from the very earliest swords about 1300 BC down to 800 BC. I'll be returning to those swords later. You can look with Bronze Age hordes at massive trade patterns. So these are all the Bronze Age copper mines that are radiocarbon dated across the whole of Europe. This is important because obviously bronze is copper and tin, typically about 90% copper, 10% tin. And we have a huge cluster of early mines in, north, in Wales and in northwest England. Um, the products of some fantastic research by the Early Mines Research Group. Now, these mines uh, are of varying sizes. The largest and most impressive is the Great Ore Mine. Uh, here we have uh, uh, Alan Williams, Dr. Alan Williams, who I collaborate with, uh, who worked extensively on these Great Ore Mines, identifying a whole range of new findings from them. Most importantly, in these 35 deep meter deep shafts, uh, he explored the sheer quantity of material and the production capacity of the Great Orm, as well as its dating. So we have all these much smaller wines in Wales and indeed in northwest England, and these largely cease production by 1700 BC. Then you have this boom mine, the Great Orm, from 1600 to 1400, and after that, it would appear that all the copper that we are consuming in this country, so remember that almost all the hordes we have are after this period, 1400 BC, is coming in from the continent. So it's an import economy on quite a large scale. And we can see where the Great Orm exports to through Allen's work with compositional isotopical analysis, indicating a very, very wide network of trade and exchange. Uh, the lack of dots in the northeast, he assures me, is largely due to the lack of scientific analysis of the bronzes being found in this particular area. And we hope to remedy that one in the future. Now, what is missing is tin. You can't make bronze without tin. And if you are actually talking in hundreds and in continental mines, thousands of tons of copper, then you need 10% of tin to make up that. Cornwall and Devon have the largest, richest, and most easily accessible sources of tin. And there are very, very few sources of tin, as you can see from the red dots in the white map uh, found in Europe. And so what we suspect is that there's actually not only an importing of copper, but potentially a mass exporting of tin as well. And all of this ends up as Bronze Age hordes, which represent only a fraction of the capacity uh, indicated by those Bronze Age mines across Europe. So only a small proportion of that metal is ending up in the hands of archaeologists and that we're identifying as hordes. We can identify all sorts of elements of craft uh, production through hordes. Uh, this could be one of my favourite examples, the Colette Horde in Northumberland, radiocarbon dated to 1840 BC, discovered in 2005. If you see those gold ornaments there, they're known as lock rings. Inside those lock rings, which was accessible because they were uh, somewhat fractured in their 3000 year history in the ground, is a beeswax core. And this remains one of the earliest known uses of beeswax. This is a beautiful ornament. Also, you'll note the object, uh, hopefully if you see my cursor just there, in the center at the bottom in the hoard. Uh, this is a razor, quite a rare find for the Northeast. Uh, all the reconstructions of Bronze Age people have the men generally heavily bearded uh, and generally quite grumpy looking. However, 
I can assure you there is plentiful evidence for razors. They were shaving, probably with animal fat. I did hear of a student in Ireland who even tried this out with replica razors himself, uh, and I'm told the result was bloody and painful. However, it did work. We can also identif identify through hordes, such as the heathery burn one, uh, entirely new technologies. So one of the big debates in the Bronze Age is when the horse is first ridden. We don't have many horse bones in Bronze Age or indeed Neolithic Britain. Um, and the debates across the whole of Europe about when the horse was first ridden and when do you have your first wagons uh, and or chariots is a huge one. And yet here in Heathery Burn, we have a beautiful set of horse gear. You can see the circular uh, phalera here. You can see the bone horse bits and you've even got the bronze knaves for the wheels as well. And so we can place this pretty firmly in the late Bronze Age uh, and we can say look, this is some of the earliest evidence we have for these new technologies. Very excitingly the Eggleston hoard I referred to earlier also revealed this object here, initially thought to be a terminal and obviously uh, an unusual and interesting object but some debate about what it was for. A discovery in Peeblesha, just to the north of us, uh, which is being excavated after being block lifted, it's uh, in the National Museum of Scotland, highlighted a fantastic hoard that's emerging in the laboratory as we speak, which not only had very similar ornaments that you can see there, but others as well, all linked together by surviving organic uh, threads. And so we're not sure what there are, but there's certainly a sword, there's certainly horse gear as well, and we could potentially reconstruct the bridle harness fittings and how they were all organized. Another thing you can do with Bronze Age objects is study combat and warfare. I've talked about swords already. Uh, fantastic uh, work by the Newcastle Bronze Age Combat Group led by Dr. Andrea Dolfini, but involving other collaborators as well, such as Marion Uckelman in Durham and Rachel Krellin now in Leicester, looked in detail at how you can identify combat marks on replica swords as well as on spears and shields and compare these to Bronze Age swords, spears and shields. And what they revealed in a paper that got downloaded somewhere in the region of 30,000 times plus just due to all its publicity is that we well, can. You can actually, through their careful, diligent recording of different actions with weapons trained collaborators, identify how sword fights actually occurred. Now this might seem a bit strange, but you have to remember that if you or I were given a sword and were told to go and attack someone who was trained how to use it, we'd last about 10 seconds. It requires a huge amount of training to use these objects, use these weapons properly. Um, and we have no shortage of swords being found in the Northeast. I wanted to highlight the one that looks like it's got a little antennae on the top here. Um, from Hoard in Northumberland. So this one here, incredibly rare one. So placed with more classic forms as well as these spectacular and quite rare spearheads. Uh, this was found in a hoard and it's one of only just a few known, uh, these antennae or antennenschwerter swords from Britain. Uh, the rest of them are found in the Low Countries and into continental Europe, Central Europe to Northern Europe. One of the most spectacular finds, I think, that has been found, and it's just over the border in North Yorkshire, but I'm completely including it uh, shamelessly, uh, is this Bronze Age shield from North Yorkshire in a private collection, uh, found, in 18, found before 1852. Sadly, we don't know the context. So this is the finest example of all known Bronze Age shields, and it even has a original leather grip. Uh, and so when we're thinking about sort of this wonderful set of preservation, this is about as good as it gets. And this was radiocarbon dated itself. What we have here is an example, if we're going back to the combat element, of a shield that was assumed due to its thinness, uh, as the one that I displayed earlier, to have been ceremonial. But the Newcastle Combat Archaeology Group demonstrated that despite this thinness, this type of these type of bronze shields um, could actually withstand sword and spear blows and would have been effective in the battlefield. 
These also demonstrate quite interesting connections. So here you have shields that you can see of similar forms uh, as were uh, uh, being found all over Ireland and into Northern Europe. These interconnections that are revealed in hordes um, can give you some really surprising results. So the High Thruston Horde at Hartlepool, for instance, uh, revealed a whole range of weird and wonderful objects, and they really were. Unusually, this was uh, well excavated and radiocarbon dated. Uh, it revealed things such as another bit of bronze horse gear, bronze spearhead, a tin wheel, the kind of thing that's found at Flag Fen, the famous Bronze Age votive depositions are a causeway where people are placing bronze metal and uh, uh, tin and other metals into the water. Um, and uh, it's also paralleled in a cave in Hansa Les in Belgium, which again is, seems to be a major votive ritual site. Uh, it revealed as well uh, tin, it revealed bronze rings, uh, a whole range of beads, including amber beads as did a hoard in Sedgefield, again with a bit of horse gear, again with some bronze rings, again with a bronze spearhead. And this has actually got me thinking about other interconnections. A really nice map that was put together by Rosso Maldoon in 2015 highlighted you've got hordes with amber in them occurring in Scotland and in Ireland, together with bronze and other ornaments. But what he missed out on clearly is looking at Northeast England, which we can extend this to. But note that central and southern Britain are missing. And one idea that I'm pondering at the moment is whether it is possible to get across the North Sea and not go up the usual Eastern Britain coastal routes across from Scandinavia, where these kind of quantities of amber would have been coming from. The reason why this might actually be tricky, uh, both to prove and to uh, argue, is that the known boats at the time are these Ferriby type boats. Um, this is uh, Ferriby in the Humber estuary. This was a, a series of boats that were discovered and recently one was reconstructed down in Falmouth. As you can see, there's no sail. We have no evidence for Bronze Age sails. So these are open boats with teams of paddlers with a potential cargo of several tons. Certainly they can navigate rivers, very likely they can do coastlines, but no one has actually tried them on open seas yet. The insurance issues alone of taking a replica boat with a selection of volunteers across some very busy shipping lanes with a strong chance of capsizing make this a very difficult ask. However, uh, there's some interesting possibilities here. And please don't forget that in the Neolithic, you have people actually actively seafaring all over Britain and Ireland and all the islands. And in the Bronze Age, they even make it to St Kilda as well, which still I don't understand. Now, how do we start understanding Bronze Age hordes in the landscape? Here I want to draw on a recent PhD by Andrew Poyer, a very nice piece of work where he tried to look at this question. But I think there's a lot more that you can actually get at in terms of exploring it in this project. It's very exciting. There are so many people signed up and potentially interested. The first thing to actually think about uh, is a very complicated diagram by Stuart Needham, my predecessor at the British Museum. And what he highlights, quite rightly, is the sheer complex potential of all the decisions that could go into an object ending up in the ground and actually then being recovered by archaeologists. There's all sorts of ways in which an object might be placed uh, into a ground and some reasons for it and it could be retrieved, it could be then placed back again, it could not be retrieved and then how would it be found? Uh, if it was placed in a certain landscape uh, that was used in a certain way, it might make it more likely to be found by archaeologists or not. And so there's whole levels of biases that mean that we have to be very careful about thinking about all sorts of distribution maps. Nonetheless, um, it's really, really interesting to see Andrew put together this fantastic map for his study area, um, Northeast Britain, highlighting the fine spots of Bronze Age metalwork, where he's highlighting these green areas here, which are notable zones of absence. These are areas where hardly any Bronze Age metalwork is being found. Um, and it's well worth thinking about why 
it would appear to be in other landscapes further uh, inland, further along the rivers, and even into higher ground as well. And he also then zeroed in on particular regions. And so it's worth thinking about um, when you see up close, for instance, the Tiltweed River catchments, you do indeed start to see relationships of the metalwork on ground that is near to rivers or overlooking rivers. And you can start to see where certain objects are placed in the landscape and try to start to build up some potential patterns or not. Uh, he also uh, looked in detail at the deposition of swords in Northumberland and was doing this work actually at the same time as Ian Colquhoun was also doing the same work. I don't think they were aware of each other. This happens a lot in archaeology. That replica boat project that I discussed with the Ferriby boat occurred at the same time as a replica of the other major find, the Dover boat, which uh, is a similar boat, and they both had replica projects going at the same time. This happens in archaeology more than you think. So here you have uh, the Ewart Park, this famous hoard site, which gave its name to not only a sword, but a whole phase in the Late Bronze Age. And what he did was to look in detail at the find spot, look at the LIDAR imagery, and visit it, and try to actually get a sense of the location in which these objects were being placed. Now you've been hearing a lot about rock art, a lot about burial monuments, a lot about megalithic monuments and their sighting in the landscape, but it's just as important to think about the sighting of Bronze Age hordes in the landscape and to see what connections or not there might be between what is going on. Um, moving further south, the Tyne River catchment really hammers home the importance of the rivers in these depositional practices. And you can see a whole range of clustering uh, in that central area. Moving further south, you've also got some interesting patterns occurring in the Weir and the Tees River catchments it's as well. Quite technical, aren't they? And I'd want to highlight the river Greta that is just uh, go running down here and obviously is um, uh, moving close towards that trans Pennine route because it's here that you have one of the large, arguably the largest Bronze Age hoard in Northern England ever found. There's some discussion over uh, whether you would count the Heatherburn Cave, which obviously could be easily repeatedly visited with many different depositional events, as the largest hoard, or whether it would be the Gilman B1. It's a bit of a strange argument. However, the Gilman B1 certainly seems to be the largest single deposition, over 100, 123 bronze objects, um, tools, and weapons primarily. And this was excavated uh, by Dennis Coggins and a small team near Gilmanby Village, Greta Valley. More recently, two further hordes were found nearby of exactly the same date and with very, very similar forms in bronze being placed into the landscape. And so one of them is here, and the second one is there. And a new project starting up, uh, funded by the Royal Archaeological Institute and the Antiquary Society, uh, led by Beverly Still of Durham University and Altogether Archaeology, is starting to do geophysical surveys and excavations in that Greta Valley landscape, in this prehistoric landscape of Upper Teesdale, to try and explore what might be going on. Now, interpretation. Uh, this is easily the thorniest topic of Bronze Age hordes. And in my uh, lifetime, it's almost come full circle. So when I was a young archaeologist, there was still quite a large amount of scholars who felt that a lot of Bronze Age hordes could be interpreted in terms of storage, or potentially accidental loss, or some sort of warfare or conflict, with a minority of these hordes being actually more votive or ritual in the placing. And as I grew up through archaeology, ritual became much, much more prevalent in terms of people's opinions. A lot of fine spots were excavated in detail. A lot of scholars who thought very deeply and hard about what ritual might look like in the archaeological record uh, started publishing some really interesting books and articles, chief amongst them Richard Bradley, uh, David Fontaine and others. And so you have sort of the swing 
essentially towards saying, right, well, these Bronze Age objects are almost certainly ritual or, or definitely ritual or essentially ritual without really defining it. And we're now getting to the stage where the, we've not really actually thought hard about what we're hoping to ex what we're hoping to see if we think it's ritual or not. It's just assumed. However, I'm slightly uneasy with this, and this is where I think this project can do some really interesting work. Um, because we're dealing with 1,700 years of metalwork deposition uh, from 2,500 BC or thereabouts, maybe a bit later, to 800 BC. After 800 BC, the next few centuries have almost no metalwork being placed in the archaeological record anywhere in Britain. So we have essentially the end of um the end of whatever reasons people have for placing metalwork in the ground there's a few hordes for sure but not many it almost falls off a cliff at about 800 bc and disappears at about 600 bc to reappear several centuries later and i'm uneasy when you have a single explanation that covers 1700 years um and i don't however think that these bronze age metal objects were being deliberately placed in the landscape and not retrieved or recycled for reasons of mass accidental loss or storage followed by some weird collective amnesia. Uh, that would just be naive. The main way we can start to think about them perhaps in this uh, broader context of evaluating uh, whether they're ritual offerings or not is looking in more detail at their landscape locations. So the fantastic work by uh, Andrew Poyer and Ian Colquhoun in highlighting the focus on springs and wetland areas, for instance, with Bronze Age swords, certainly does seem to nudge towards a, rotive, a votive or ritual explanation. Um, however, there are far more bronze and gold objects now known from Northeast England that cannot be easily explained in the same way and require investigation, ideally more detailed investigation into their landscape context. It's worth noting that when I was at the British Museum, I was in charge of the Bronze Age hordes being found by members of the public through the treasure scheme in England. And I had counterparts who were dealing with the Iron Age, Roman periods, uh, early medieval, etc. And I did note that essentially the Bronze Age and the Iron Age perspective on what was ritual was far more enthusiastic than colleagues in later periods. For Romanists and early medievalists, and especially medievalists, they would only entertain ritual in very specific circumstances of discovery. Whereas Bronze Age and Iron Age scholars like myself and my counterparts were much more enthusiastic to just think ritual before anything else. So I think it comes down to carefully investigating that landscape context, seeing what patterns there are. Obviously, we're never going to actually get inside people's heads and get the true intentions behind what was going on. But it's nonetheless worth investigating. Now, so what can belief uh, in the Northeast do with Bronze Age hordes? Uh, one, pro one potential inspiration was a project that I did with Dig Ventures, uh, and this was a project uh, at Morecambe Barrow, where the discovery of two fairly unexceptional uh, Bronze Age bronzes led to an excavation uh, at the site which revealed a early Bronze Age ring cairn, bron early Bronze Age cremations, and middle Neolithic pits. And this indicates that you've got a particular site of interest that's repeatedly used for, it would appear, uh, ceremonial or ritual funerary uses throughout prehistory. And it gives us a real insight into an area that had been largely overlooked. Uh, this actually attracted a lot of attention. Uh, and whilst the site had to remain uh, shielded from the public in its location, it led to pop-up and virtual museums, lots of interest from schools. Uh, and you can visit the virtual museum now and see the other discovery that we made just a few miles away, the Lancaster Horde. Chatting with colleagues about other possible options that could be done. Um, you can investigate those fine spots more thoroughly. What Andrew and Ian did using LIDAR and other images and other maps to investigate the fine spots does actually reveal some interesting patterns. You can actually visit many of the fine spots uh, to understand the landscape location. And a key thing I think is understanding the hydrology, where the springs are, where there were wetlands, where there are wetland areas to try and understand that. 
I'd be really interested to know, and no one to my knowledge has done this systematically, how when you compare, say, the location of Bronze Age hordes and those of later periods, Iron Age, Roman, early medieval, Viking, etc., the medieval, um, how these compare. Is it the same? Is it the case that they're just reusing the same locations and different scholars are giving them different explanations? Um, how do these hordes compare to prehistoric monuments? Down south, the hordes are by and large not placed in relationship to um, earlier prehistoric monuments. It's relatively rare to find them in association with, say, Bronze Age barrows or Neolithic um, uh, or Neolithic monumental complexes. Whereas in the north of England, there's definitely emerging evidence at quite a few sites that these Bronze Age hordes are being placed in relation to these prehistoric monuments, as we found at Morecambe. Another thing, and this uh, builds on the fantastic work of Ed Caswell, that is a work in progress, uh, that uh, is feeding into uh, what would be a comprehensive and single online catalogue of all Bronze Age metal objects, not just the hordes, he's working on the hordes, but the idea being we can actually make this uh, information all freely accessible so we can really start to understand it and hand it on for those future generations who will be exploring the archaeology for themselves. With that, I shall leave it there. Thank you very, very much. Right, there's always that unnerving point when you finish giving a talk and nobody says anything. So, um, so thank you very much, Ben. I'm just going to start my video again. So that was that was really great. Um, as, as you said right at the beginning, we've, we've been hearing lots about the the big stones, the, the rock art, the things that don't move around landscapes, and you've been giving us a really good insight into actually the stuff that does move around. So it's the, the finished the finished items and all the bits and pieces that you need to make the finished items. So that's something I I, I thought was quite, for me, it's a very much a non-prehistorian. I think it's quite a useful way of thinking about all those flows of, of material to make it before we even get to thinking about what you do with them and then getting rid of them. So this idea of the objects having biographies, I think it's a really, a really nice one. So I'll probably hand over to, Paul, are you still there, Paul? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll let you compare the questions. Um, so I okay. know there's some, I know there's some comments and questions in chat, uh, but thank you very much for that, Ben. That was really really interesting. No, brilliant, and also the idea for um, ways in which this project might be able to help as well, which um, I think probably we need to have a, a chat about and see if we can come up with some sort of a methodology to get people out looking at these places. But um, to look at some of the questions um, that people have been asking, um, <clears throat> some quite specific ones to start with. Somebody's asking about um, horses and, and horse harnesses. Um, does the type of horse harness um, found in hordes, the kind of objects, do they give an indication of whether animals are being used as draft animals or for riding? Um, this is a very good question indeed. Um, the main debates around how horses are used are not actually very orientated around the people that study bronze. Across Europe there is this very lively debate at the moment uh, about when horses were first domesticated and what they were domesticated for commonly thought that they're domesticated earliest in the Eurasian steppes in what is uh, potentially modern Kazakhstan, uh, which is where the earliest dates are coming from. And uh, there's a lively debate over whether this is for meat, for milk, and then when people start riding them. And the discussions on the bones are frequently along the lines of the wear on the teeth, uh, that could be caused by bits, uh, and indeed on the wear of the bones in terms of uh, how they're used potentially for draft, potentially for riding. In short, in Britain, the evidence we have, especially for the bones, is very, very sparse indeed. No one, to my knowledge, has proper evidence to argue for the riding of horses before the late Bronze Age in Britain, though it is often thought that it may well be earlier, and there's, some, there's quite a lot of discussion about the third millennium BC and that whole uh, sort of uh, beaker phenomenon potentially being associated that Andrew Fitzpatrick and Chris Fowler talked about. However, we don't have the evidence to say that. So 
Uh, it may well be that we get some fantastic evidence emerging, but much of the evidence now is largely around the fancy bronze gear that you get associated with horses and not the horse bones because we can't find them. And so as such, I can't easily answer that question in any great detail. <laughs> it's, it's quite a profound thing though, isn't it? Because um, horse riding opens up so many opportunities in terms of managing landscapes and being able to travel um, that, that, that getting a handle on um, how people can get around the landscape and maybe exercise control over larger areas. And the horse makes a big difference to all that. Um, One thing to highlight that it's thought. in Northern Britain that we're getting all the evidence for horse gear. Southern Britain has some, but not on the scale of what's coming up in the Northeast in England uh, and okay. in the Northwest, the Lancaster horde that I highlighted has some horse gear, but equally in Scotland as well. And so one thing I'm slightly intrigued about is uh, obviously you're probably bringing horses that can be ridden over potentially with horse gear and where that is actually happening. And again, the work hasn't really been done to answer those questions and put together the new data for it. There's a project for somebody. Um, three questions here that might be related. Um, what is your best guess as to why the large coastal areas on Poyer's map are zones of absence or appear to be zones of absence when the coast, the sea, was so important in the Bronze Age? Um, uh, somebody else had suggested, had observed that the, the, the blank areas appear to correlate with um, magnesium, limestone and other thin soils. Uh, Maybe the case for some of them, I'm not quite sure whether it's right for all of them. Um, and somebody else has asked, and I, I don't know whether this is relevant to this or not, um, would some soils result in destruction of bronze objects so you wouldn't find them if in fact they had been buried? Um, the advantage of bronze and certainly gold is that it survives pretty much any soil, although it varies in terms of how well it survives in terms of the, the quality. So you'll see some new finds that get announced to the world an excited finder and they look pretty horrible because they've been in an environment that's has caused uh, more extensive corrosion than others. However, unlike, say, tin, which is thought in a few environments not to oxidise and, and therefore not really survive, bronze does and gold certainly does. In terms of zones of absence, um, that's an interesting question. You get some zones of absence that can be explained for the simple reason that the land use meant that objects can't easily be found. If there is, for instance, a long-term woodland being placed there, then you're not going to get objects being found as they usually are during farming or labouring. Um, if you've got landowners such as, say, the National Trust, who don't allow any metal detectorists on their land, you can get these weirdly big gaps uh, in your nice distribution maps because metal detectors haven't been on there and therefore a lot hasn't been found. Um, but the questioner has a very good point. The coastal areas, if you certainly go down to uh, East Anglia or down on the southeast or down into other parts of southern England or in North Wales, there are very, very pronounced coastal distributions. And a lot of activity is going in around, going on in around the coast during the Bronze Age. So quite why you have these. There's no, there's very little sense of these bronzes being placed in or around uh, settlements by and large, with the exception of this fantastic prehistoric Pompeii at Must Farm near Peterborough, where the house burnt down. We think the inhabitants essentially got out just in time and the bronzes were left in situ along with everything else as it collapsed in the river and the silt closed over. So we don't have many of them in settlements and the indications are from say, Richard Bradley's study of the North and South Downs, uh, along with David Yates, that you've got settlement areas and usually spring areas in which bronzes are placed. So, yeah, there's an element of that. Throw in also some issues of coastal erosion and development as well. Oh. Um, just uh, uh, not a question, but a comment. I'm going to read it out. Thank you, Marie. Thank you all so much. I miss visiting the Northeast where I lived as a teenager. And so you have brought me home as well as feeding my love of prehistory. I look forward to whatever else you do. 
Really appreciate it, Marie. So thank you very much, Marie. Thank you very much. Uh, there are also lots of other um, lots of other uh, thank you messages coming in from, from which I'm trying to uh, which I'm trying to get in between to find the questions. Um, Andrew Fitzpatrick, thank you for answering a question. Um, somebody had asked, what are the lugs for on the axes? And Andrew had kind of you said they're for fixing them to handles, which I think probably we'd all agree with. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, somebody had sent in an observation um, saying that in Norfolk, a lot of amber gets washed up on the beach. Um, so there's a question there, how, how much do we know, um, how much amber is actually imported and how much is picked up on the beach? Excellent question. Um, a key thing to think about here is this amber distribution is that yes, you certainly get amber from the Baltic that is washed up uh, on the coastline of Eastern Britain. And it's, we can't chemically distinguish that amber that is washed up from amber that is sourced from the Baltic, where it originally came from. However, with the kind of distribution map that you're seeing in the late Bronze Age that I showed you, where you've got easily the largest amount of amber in Ireland with these fantastic sort of amber necklaces. And I showed you one there, which uh, is, is a lot of amber. This is Ireland. So this is further removed from that coastal uh, wash by quite a long way. There's the whole island of, of, uh, of, of Britain in the way. So essentially, my feeling is that that distribution and the sheer quantity of amber in Ireland uh, as well as that distribution extending around Scotland and into northeast England indicates there is a trade route there. But I do take the point, certainly if we were in East Anglia, um, I would be answering, asking many more questions about its sourcing, but that distribution uh, clinches it. But I can't scientifically prove that. Great. There's a complex, quite complex question here from Andrew Fitzpatrick. Oh, um, how does Ben cook broccoli? Oh, um, badly, <laughs> I don't think badly, you have to answer that, but it goes back badly, to your comments yeah. at the start. <laughs> um, mean, yeah. Lockdown has been fun for everyone, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, is there... Um, is there much difference... Can't control my computer here. Um, is there much difference between... Um, Sorry that I'm not giving the individual names for everybody who's asking these questions, but I, I'm, um, I'm struggling to get my head around the board as it is. Um, is there much difference between the finds that come out of Bronze Age burials and the items that are found in these deposit locations, the hoards? Um, yes. Are certain items reserved as grave goods or is what is deposited not exclusive to either type of site? We have a very weird situation in the Bronze Age. So Chris Fowler gave a fantastic talk on uh, the early Bronze Age burials um, and his book's definitely recommended reading on that. And what you will have noted is that there are literally there are hundreds of these uh, burial mounds and he highlighted the complexities, multiple burials and grave goods within them. Now, with all the grave goods that he's talking about from pots to ornaments and things like that you do get a few bronzes uh frequently uh daggers um and you may get uh the odd axe or thereabouts and maybe a few other objects now the hordes at that early bronze age time are typically a few flat axes and maybe the odd halberd uh, and that's pretty much about it there's not many of them and they're very restricted indeed. Now, around about 1500-ish BC or thereabouts, you have a huge and wholesale change in funerary rites across Britain. And this is something that I've, I've worked on with Ed Caswell, where essentially everyone goes into the ground, apparently now, if you see them archaeologically, as a very simple cremation, not accompanied by grave goods and maybe accompanied by a pot and frequently not even in a particular monumental uh, structure so and then in the late bronze age so by about 1100 bc and, and this is what uh, beverly stills looking at for her phd you're getting a whole diversity of very fragmentary funerary rites and so there's probably maybe 10, I'd say max 20 late Bronze Age 
burial sites that we can identify in the northeast of England. Um, and that's, yeah, I did a survey myself. I think the numbers have increased since then. So the visibility of the dead goes right down. They don't get any grave goods anymore. And that all happens just as the amount of bronze in the landscape goes through the ceiling. So we can't easily compare what is a bronze grave good with what is a typical mm. bronze to go in a hoard because the hoarding phase is happening 15, 1600 maybe onwards. And that's when you get essentially very non, very, very, very low visibility of the dead or just very uh, similar cremations with no grave goods. And anything before that is all about the dead mm. and just a few hoards. Does that make sense? It's, so it's like it, yeah, 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 it does. It, it does, but it's also um, very roughly at that time, isn't it? When we get this something, I'm, you know, I know it's a very simplistic way of describing it, but where you get this change from a landscape based on, or, or where stone circles and burial monuments and what we might call ritual things seem to be the most important things to a time in the later Bronze Age when it's much more about agriculture and visible settlements. Um, yep. so, so this is dated... Remember, it, this is something that uh, Ed Castle did his uh, PhD on um, with me. And this, so you have it 1700 BC uh, is when you have a uh, wholesale appearance, uh, north, south, east and west of Britain and in Ireland of roundhouses across both islands. And it's about 1700 BC. You get this huge change there in certain areas, certainly uh, in southern Britain. You're getting the appearance of field systems as well uh, and increasingly we find more and more dated evidence for field systems further north so it's around about 1700 ish now how far the field systems and the settlements can be packaged together uh, and then packaged again with new funerary rites or this massive increase in hoarding uh, in the landscape and placing metal objects in the landscape that's kind of a question but that period is the major transition for me uh, so yeah. just as Andrew <clears throat> talked about that beaker phase, um, that's that's one major transition. The next one, I think, is somewhere around 1600 BC. Sure. <clears throat> um, you, you touched on this after somebody had asked the question, um, but I think it's an important issue. Um, are they, are they, as in hordes, are hordes found near stone circles or other ritual monuments? Um, uh, we've touched on the dating, the dating issue of these things is, is crucial to try and understand, um, to understand relationships. But I know I, I'm, I've said this after, I think, pretty much every talk. I'm really keen on trying to break down the barriers between these separate things. We have to divide things up to understand them and to talk about them. But they, there must be links between different kinds of things like if, like ritual monuments, hordes, um, and maybe... Sorry, I'm answering this myself. I didn't intend to do that when I started asking the question. But um, maybe the key thing is to look at the links between the different places in terms of where they occur in the landscape and how they relate to the natural landscape, um, rather than necessarily direct links between different sites. Do you, do you think that's maybe a fair comment? Yeah, if I think that makes that any sense. Is, um, it makes sense. As I've said, there's quite there's emerging evidence from quite a few sites where you're getting Bronze Age hordes that appeared to be in, on, or very near earlier sites uh, that are funerary or, or sort of or more substantial monuments in any case. So you've got that. The challenge when you're talking about sort of the broader landscape stuff is demonstrating that there might not be a connection. So for me, at least, you need to carefully think, OK, when is a connection a connection? And when is it just inevitable? So you can, for instance, you can actually talk a huge amount about settlements being uh, in and along river systems uh, in Britain, and you can make a fairly solid case for that. Um, this is slightly undermined by the fact that you obviously have no end of rivers in Britain, and you're maybe never more than 10 kilometers away from a river. So you have to set your set your boundaries as to where you think, okay, well, this is a very likely connection where in, in this particular landscape, and this is maybe uh, in a gray area, and this is maybe a bit far away for me to say there's a relationship. Does, does that make sense? Um, yeah, but things could be in different physical places, but could relate in a similar way to things like rivers and hills. And, and oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm absolutely locations. fine. Yeah, I'm absolutely fine with that. Sorry, I was just thinking in the same landscape. But yes, yeah, no, I mean, 
I think it, it's just clarity. I think I guess I'm coming from it having dealt with a few too many Bronze Age archaeologists for whom ritual is is just a catch-all for everything. And so I, I guess I'm sort of now coming in the sort of upper end of the cycle. Uh, so, well, that takes us right back to the start about yeah, what is ritual now? Is it different? But we're, we're not we're not going there again tonight. Um, mm. Here's here, this this um, this must be a good question because it starts off. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, and then is there a cross referencing amongst the horde experts as to belief? Um, in pre-Roman, Roman, and then the non-Earth-based religion of Christianity, where they were referencing something else. So I suppose this is asking not about how Bronze Age hordes relate to things that might have happened before, but how they might relate to things that happened afterwards, if I understand that right. Um, in terms of Christianity, I don't know, this is a David Pettit's question, because he's actually looked at this very question, and one of our colleagues, uh, our head of department, Professor Sarah Temple, has written a whole book on this uh, question as well, of the appropriation of prehistoric sites and monuments by uh, um, early medieval and, and early Christian societies. So, I mean, I will definitely hand over to the expert, and it's not me. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good question. It, it, it's how we relate, kind of, the archaeology for rituals which we find to the kind of the broader belief systems and how easy it is to actually do that and certainly I mean one of the things I would say is that these kind of traditions of of burying of burying hordes things in the ground it, it's a really long-lived tradition so you get it in the you get it as we've seen in the Bronze Age you know when you get into East Anglia you get some amazing late Iron Age hordes with like Gold talks and places like Snettersham, uh, amazing. Then, then in the Roman period, they're still sticking. I mean, basically in East Anglia, they love bury, burying masses of amount of, of massive amounts of precious metals in the ground. And then you get into the late Roman period, and you get um, hordes like the one from Hoxton and the one from Mildenhall, which are big late Roman silver plate hordes. Um, with clear Christian imagery on. So Roman Christians are still putting hordes in the ground because for them, that's a way of you know, it, reaching reaching God in their, own, in their own kind of way. So the Roman Christian, if you said they were being pagan, would probably be absolutely outraged. I mean, they'd probably, they'd probably kind of yeah, punch you. But, but there's still the way in which people do religion still kind of stays the same. And you get burial kind of votive deposits put in into the ground over a really long time so even in the even in the later medieval period if you want to get rid of an old font you have to bury it you know, according to church law oh. you're not you're not allowed to um just you know put plants in it like actually a lot of churches do nowadays but technically you were meant to bury them so they couldn't you know so they were kind of safe so we have these very long-term practices but the actual meanings ascribed probably varied massively and we still throw coins in wishing wells today. My children do. Don't so. we? Some of us. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the tradition is still there. Um, so, uh, right. Um, more thank yous coming in. Uh, I thought I just noticed one more question. Um, oh, I think maybe you've dealt with it. There was another one asking about um, uh, relations between Bronze Age hordes and Iron Age and what comes later. And um, once again, I think um, think I think Andrew had provided an answer to that, but I can't find it now. Um, but I think we're um, I think we're just about done now in terms of the questions. I think there is um, oh, hang on. Do you think everyone would have do you think everyone would have had bronze tools as they must have been in demand? I think certainly in the later part of the Bronze Age, so from about 1600, 1500 BC, you get this full bronze adoption. So remember that flint working carries on being done for a really, to a really high technical degree until, the, uh, until around 1600, 1500 BC. And they're doing some incredible work with flint and they carry on using it, but they don't put any technical effort into it in the later part of the Bronze Age, so after that date. And this is where you get the huge expansion of bronze weapons, bronze tools, bronze ornaments. Now, in terms of who had what, it's quite tricky. 
there is the one site, as I mentioned, at Must Farm, our essentially sort of Bronze Age Pompeii, if you will, where you had this uh, incredible preservation in the wetland, uh, the, fe the fenland just outside of Peterborough, and the house burning down to boot. So you have probably the closest evidence we might get to what would be a household set of bronze. And we're looking potentially at each house having somewhere around seven axes, two spears, two sickles, two chisels and gout or gouges and a razor. Um, now, how far you can extrapolate that, that site dates to 850 BC. So the rest of Britain, I don't know, but it's as reasonable a guess as anything. I certainly think that there are objects that very few people possessed. Those shields, for instance, would have taken hundreds of hours to create. They would have originally cast a bronze disc about the size of a dinner plate, and that's because that's how far they could really get those consistent discs to. And then you'd have had endless cycles of hammering and heating uh, to actually get to that 60 centimeters or uh, above uh, scale with that very, very thin sheet. And then all the embossing as well in certain shields as well. So very, very, very few people would have had access to that kind of craftsmanship. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think it's fair to say that in that later part of the Bronze Age, yes, everyone was having fun. Okay, a um, couple more interesting questions coming in, but just before them, um, somebody said, can, can we provide the full um, citation for the Poirier paper? It's, it's not a paper, is it? It's his PhD. Yes. Uh, and it is available I, online. It's available online. At, I can put the put it in the chat bar uh, if you want. It's at Sheffield University. Um, and it's got a nice list of hordes at the very end. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was trying to read it today. I think it's brilliant. Um, well, speaking of somebody who doesn't know a huge amount about the subject, I think it's a superb introduction to it. Um, so, yeah, if you could put that link in, that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, just, while yeah. you're doing that, I'll ask another question, which I think is a bit of a key one, um, about the condition of um, metal objects in hordes. Um, there's a couple of questions. Somebody just said generally about what's the condition of the objects that you find in hordes, and somebody else has asked, is there evidence that these things were actually decommissioned or damaged, um, by which I, I sort of I get the impression they're asking were they deliberately damaged um, prior to deposition? Um, so I'll take, uh, yeah, the question about the decommissioning. I'm just going to put this in the chat bar, multitasking. <laughs> there still not something to that I've ever trying to do that. Part. There you go. It's, uh, oh, sorry, that's gone direct to one person. I'm going to do that to everyone so you can all get the poor reference there. Right. Multitasking over. Um, You'll so be the most read PhD for a while. <laughs> so decommissioning, yes. Um, this is something that has been explored in detail by a range of scholars and uh, recently discussed by Matt Knight, uh, who's the Bronze Age Curator at the National Museum of Scotland, but also by others before him as well. There are weapons that appear to be hacked just repeatedly down the side, almost a whole series of chops, and they are then placed into uh, lakes, rivers, and bogs. And so famously, there's a hoard fished out of Duddingston Loch at Edinburgh in the National Museum of Scotland, where it would appear to be that you've got burning and deliberate damaged weaponry and other bronzes. Now, that is definitely the sort of ritual votive end of things. Now, Rob Wiseman did a fantastic piece of work where he looked at the size of the metal of the bronze scrap found in late Bronze Age hoards and realized that actually the majority of the scrap had been reduced to something around about the size of a socketed axe and a few hundred grams and conveniently sized to be placed in a crucible for remelting. So we get a lot of scrap hoards, especially down south in East Anglia and southeast England. There's over 50 in Kent alone, late Bronze Age scrap hoards, where there are lots and lots and lots of bits and pieces of bronze. And this is where we're getting to the stage where you're starting to wonder, okay, if there's this consistency in this uh, breaking, it is decommissioning, but for uh, what particular purpose? The Gilman B. Hoard is our biggest and most spectacular example of that. And you saw just the complete objects there, but you've also seen the Abdur Hoards found near that in the Greta Valley. These are large uh, collections of uh, some complete and some very broken objects. 
So some of them have clearly been used to death and there's been some nice studies of use wear on bronzes and how much bron a bronze axe can take and how you can study its wear traces. But some have clearly been broken. And uh, this is where Matt Knight has explored how much effort it takes, what you have to do to break a bronze. So I think a lot of decommissioning, some of it seems to end up in a kind of votive or ritual style context, and others seems to be a little bit too systematic and suspiciously scrap-like. And again, if I was an early medieval or a medievalist, I'd look at it and think, oh, that's scrap, um, and potentially not go down the ritual route quite as enthusiastically. Yeah. Um... I remember when I was studying things in Coquitel years ago, noticing that a couple of swords there seemed to have been deliberately broken before they were put in the in in the ground. Yep. Um, but then, of course, the other ones nearby, there are others that are buried intact and indeed carefully buried vertically in the ground, aren't there? So there's different things going on in different places. Unsurprisingly, um, another question: um, Can do you think that the idea of hoarding can be linked to climate change? Is somehow our wet places in some way linked to um, the climate maybe getting wetter? Not easily, no. So uh, why I say that is that the climate gets uh, significantly wetter and colder around 800 BC. And um, that seen we have the peak of bronze age hoarding before then and it obviously is, is peaking between about a thousand and eight hundred bc or maybe one thousand one hundred and eight hundred bc if you remember that graph of uh, how many hordes are found when that's when you've got the peak and it then gets colder and wetter after that now given that there's this big uh presence of bronzes between 1100 and 800 BC being placed in wetland and wet areas. So Flag Fen being the most spectacular example, again, just down from Must Farm, actually, uh, outside of Peterborough. It's not easy for me to see how the increased amount of water and the decreased amount of temperature when it gets colder and wetter, 800 BC, connects with hoarding then more or less stopping. But I could be wrong. Uh, so it's a difficult one to connect. You can do correlation, but not easily causation. Okay, okay. Um, questions are still flying in, um, kind of related to that, I suppose, in a way of dating. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, how is the date marking the end of the Bronze Age and the start of the Iron Age established? Yeah, hobby horse of mine. There, these, there, there's no great divides between these different things. There's, there's, there are transitions and things transition. Some things transitioned as much within periods as they did at the end of them. But um, I, I, sorry, I'm ask, answering the question again. But uh, how is the date marking the end of the Bronze Age and the start of the Iron Age established? Is this firmly accepted? So the key thing to realize is that the Bronze Age isn't just about bronze and that the Iron Age is not simply about iron for the simple reason that for the first few centuries of the Bronze Age and the first few centuries of the Iron Age, there's hardly any of the uh, actual metal that the period is named after in circulation. So first few centuries of the Bronze Age, there's really not much in the way of bronze that we're seeing in the archaeological record. There might be more that, uh, that was in circulation, but it's nowhere near what it becomes later on. Equally, for an Iron Age scholar, you have to wait till about 300 BC to actually start seeing a lot of iron in the archaeological record. And you've got the earliest evidence for iron occurring at 1000 BC. So the earliest evidence for iron in Britain and indeed Northwest Europe is occurring when you've got peak bronze consumption. And like copper before it, um, the adoption of a new metal takes a very long time indeed. And so the convention of ending the Bronze Age at 800 BC is less and less about bronze or iron the more we discover. What is really quite surreal is between uh, 800 BC, supposedly the beginning of the Iron Age, um, and at least 400 maybe 300 BC, there's hardly any iron at all. And after 600 BC, there's hardly any bronze. So you have this weird situation where people have discussions about, should we call this, I don't know, the 
the age of, of bone, because in certain areas, they stop even making ceramics. Between 800 BC and 600 BC, you hardly get any ceramics in central and northern Britain. <laughs> and so you've, you've got a sense of like, okay, the metal's gone, the ceramics have gone, what the, what, what are they doing? <laughs> or not? No. So, um, yeah, and added to that, radiocarbon dating struggles with a plateau at that period. So there's this weird time at the end of the Bronze Age where we can't date anything accurately. There's not much material. Climate changes, certainly, but not apocalyptically. And, um, yeah, we just don't know. And Iron Age scholars don't like the period because it's too much like the Bronze Age. And Bronze Age scholars <laughs> don't like the Iron Age. So it gets ignored. Um, yeah. Classic, classic. You need to invent some concept like the Chalcolithic between and then get some specialists to study in it. That's what needs to be done. Yeah, to be honest, the rebranding of it might be more useful. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. A um, couple of questions about specific places. Um, a question about Calabern. I don't remember Calabern having any metalwork associated with it. Um, is that a site you're familiar with? Mm. No, I'm not quite sure why the question's been asked. There's a burial at Calabern, Bronze Age burial um, up near Holt Whistle, but I. I don't think no. it relates to metalwork, so I'm not sure. I don't know if, if roll back, but... Malcolm, if you want to clarify what the question's about, but I, I don't remember um, there being any metalwork there. Um, also, it, it somebody's. Asked... I mean, there are, there are. You say there are, there are a lot of sites, and and yeah, I, yeah, um, I'd have a look in the appendix of Andrew Poyer's. Uh, well, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with that site, and I don't remember there being any metalwork there. But then again, what my memory is worth these days, there might be. Um, Someone's asked, where are the Ewart swords? Are they in the Great North Museum? Yep, they are. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, I think we might be just about getting there. Um, yeah, so if you, somebody's asking about um, were the swords somehow were the broken ones relating to the, the vanquished in combat and 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 whole ones relating to the victors but I, I don't know if you want to say anything about that um we have yeah it's difficult to identify who won and who lost we have precisely one bronze age battlefield that is in northwest germany at a site called tollense tollense valley and this would appear to have been a battle um between around about 1300 bc uh between two groups uh potentially in the hundreds and one group, the isotopes from their bones indicate that they were local, and one group appears to have more non-local diverse origins. There's lots of evidence for arrowheads uh, that we don't really get in hordes or anything like that. So lots of arrows being used, some swords, uh, wooden clubs as well, and the fighting appears to be brutal, absolutely brutal. So uh, really um, no kind of nice homeric style champion challenging mm. champion it's more like a slaughter mm. so um that's the only preserved battlefield that we have and okay it's i don't think bronze age communities could have sustained those kind of battles on a regular basis but i think there's quite a lot of low level combat going on and obviously with all that weaponry you need to be trained how to use it can't emphasize enough having tried to wield a sword and throw a spear, barely throw a spear at all, it's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> you need a lot of training to do this stuff. And I'm six foot, three, so yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, careful, because you'll get everybody asking if we can have sessions teaching people how to throw uh, spears and um, it's humbling. Maybe swords. <laughs> um, uh, there's an interesting point being raised here about the making of the objects. Um, mm -hmm. The, the question specifically saying if you need charcoal to make um, bronze objects, would t would tools tend to be made in the lowlands rather than in the uplands? But there's a whole wider issue there about where things are made as well. Yeah, so we have the weirdest thing, oh, so many weird things with bronze edge. So we have these fantastic copper mines. We have this huge rich tin source that we think is being extensively exploited. And we have one two ish sites where copper smelting is taking place definitely one um i.e the creation of copper metal from copper ore and uh, that one is is also near the great orm of pentrin and um that's that's late bronze age but whilst we have a lot of evidence in settlements for molds and indicating potentially metal working was carried out this is secondary 
metalworking, i.e. this is casting, this is remelting, recycling. We don't really have much in the evidence for primary stuff. So we don't know, for instance, where all the tons of copper coming out of the Great Horn and all the tons of tin, presumably coming out of Cornwall and Devon, are meeting and being made into bronze. We should have really thumping great production sites, but we don't. And they've clearly been destroyed by maybe later mining or, or farming activity. But we can be fairly certain that a lot of secondary metal working, so that remelting, recycling, recasting, you can always recycle metal. Theoretically, we should have no hoards at all. They could just endlessly recycle everything and they wouldn't have to acquire more metal. And that we think is happening in a lot of settlements. And so um, it's a fair bet that a lot of the simpler tools could have been cast and made fairly locally. Okie dokie. Um, somebody had asked specifically about the Tweed near Norham. I don't know whether there was something shown on one of the maps um, asking what specifically had been found um, in the Tweed near Norham. That's probably an unfair question to ask. You, I, it's quite specific. Yeah, I would. I'm not. Yeah, I would go to as again the Andrew Poyer PhD. <laughs> I was going to say refer him to that. You can you can literally do Control F on the PDF and search for your favourite location, and <laughs> uh, you'll find a hoard that comes up, um, or an object that comes up. So yeah, I, I've got an idea, but I think I'm wrong. So I, I'll, I'll dodge that one if I'm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Well, I, I think perhaps thank you so much. It's super interesting, and, and all the questions obviously have shown how much people have been paying attention. Um, and uh, I found it so interesting. I think maybe um, maybe we'll draw it to a close by um, comment from Julie Coxon there. Thank you so much all, wonderful as ever. How can we do any better than that to finish? Wonderful as ever, so thank you for that. Thanks again to Ben. I mean, I've been learning a lot. I've been doing archeology span for far too many years. And I'm still learning loads of stuff from these lectures. That's been really, really useful. And as I said, uh, expect to hear from us soon about future events, future lectures, future future field work. So keep an eye on your inboxes. If you're not, if you're not registered with us, our website's www.beliefne.net. You can find us by Google or email me. Because um, uh, I know some people are having the links passed on by other people. But if you want it direct, let, give send me your email address and I can get you on our list. And yes, I, I will. I'll, you'll be hearing from us soon, particularly about the Holy Wells project as well. So otherwise, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank thanks, everybody. Ben. Thank you. All. Thank you. See thank you all for coming. Bye. 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 B